Should parents be told when their teenage daughter is pregnant and seeking an abortion? Californians will decide when they vote on Proposition 73 in the November special election. That's next on The Body Politic. Good evening and welcome to The Body Politic. I'm Michael Bernstein, a professor of history and the Dean of Arts and Humanities here at the University of California, San Diego. I think it's fair to say that the most emotional issue on the ballot for California voters this November is Proposition 73, which if passed would amend the California Constitution to require that health care providers notify the parent of a teenager with an unwanted pregnancy at least 48 hours before performing an abortion. Here to make the case in support of Proposition 73 is Michaeline Friedenberg, the president of Life Perspectives, a national organization that calls itself pro-life and pro-woman and advocates safe, holistic solutions to reduce the number of abortions in the United States. On the other side, we have Nancy Sasaki, she is the chief operating officer of Planned Parenthood of San Diego and Riverside counties, the second largest Planned Parenthood affiliate in the country. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Michaeline, why is this proposition necessary in your view? Why is it on the ballot? Well, it's very important for parents to have knowledge if their pregnant daughter is contemplating undergoing surgery, and not just any surgery, an abortion. Um, because we know that there are physical complications that are possible, but more than that, there's an emotional impact that we know. I certainly know that as a woman who had an abortion at 18, how that's impacted my life. And to have the benefit of her parents to be involved in that decision-making process, especially for those teens who may be involved with a much older boyfriend, which we see in study after study that tends to be the case where they're five or more years older than them, and um, if they're being pressured into having that abortion, their parents can at least offset that pressure and help them to think about their options, what each of those options will mean into the future, if, they, if she ends up, because it's her decision ultimately, but if she ends up deciding to have the abortion, then she has the benefit of her parents' involvement in seeking medical care, they know her full medical history, her psychological makeup, and then they are available for her after the abortion um, for whatever she may be dealing with. Excuse me. You know, Michael, what's interesting is the question was, what is this initiative and what is it really going to do? And when you start and look at the surface of this initiative where they're wanting to enhance parent-child communication, where you want to try and get children and their parents to talk about these particular medical issues, I as a parent absolutely agree. I want to know what's going on with my daughter. But in these particular situations, um, you've got to look at the fact that sometimes daughters can't come to their parents for whatever reason that may be. As a mom, I really want her to be able to do that, but I also know there may be reasons why she can't. She may not want to disappoint me. She may be afraid, but what I do know is that I ultimately want to know that where she goes, she's going to be safe, that where she goes, she's going to get accurate and appropriate medical information and counseling. And this initiative, if you look at it, it doesn't do anything that really enhances parent and child communication. Well, clearly, the key issue here, you've both spoken to it immediately, is the interaction between parent and child in a major life decision, uh, in this case a, a medical decision as well. So uh, what happens when parent and teenager don't necessarily get along uh, or, or are, uh, for various reasons, as Nancy suggests, in, unable to come to some open-handed uh, discussion uh, about this life decision. What, what's proposed in the proposition and how would that proposal work, if at all? Well, certainly, if we're talking about um, a healthy, functioning home, um, there may be discomfort or embarrassment at first, but it certainly is worth it to get beyond that point to have the involvement of her parents. And but in if that we're situation, many times what we see in our clinics that is, is that, in fact, the, the young teenagers come in with their parents. They do involve an adult. They do involve their parents. So this initiative really isn't addressed to those particular families where they do already involve their parents. But, but 
but in the case where this involvement doesn't exist, there's the so-called judicial bypass. So how does that Abs work? Absolutely. Well, if, if a minor either felt that she was mature enough to make this decision on her own, she could seek to have a waiver by a judge. Um, but really what this is intended more for is to protect those young women who are the victims of abuse and where they fear that there would be physical abuse or perhaps the pregnancies even originated from a family member. And this allows them to go before a judge and then that triggers help for her well, so that she does... Let me ask in this regard though, why would a teenager then necessarily be less intimidated by a judge than a parent? I mean, we're, we're talking now about under what circumstances a teenager is able to make an informed decision and involve right. an appropriate adult. Well, in this case, it would be dangerous for her to go to her parent, and that's really the circumstance that we're talking about. I mean, that's a, a minority, but we need to be concerned about that, that if there is a dangerous situation where she could face physical abuse or there has been sexual abuse from the family, then she needs to receive help. And the judicial bypass does allow that because a judge then can step in and make sure that she doesn't have a secret abortion and is returned back to the abuse. And I think that one of the concerns, there are actually two different issues with regard to the judicial bypass, and I think you were kind of going there in terms of what is the reality? I mean, think about it in the real world, going to court, that's very intimidating. It's intimidating as an adult, and for a young person to try to figure out where the juvenile court is, are they going to need to get an attorney, are they going to be in you know some area where there are gang members or you know what is the situation going to be is it going to cost her money how much time is that going to take that's very intimidating and I think that the initiative on its surface when you start talking about whether or not where is a child going to turn when she's in time of need the last she doesn't need at this time a judge what she needs is a counselor she needs to be going be able to go somewhere where she can trust that adult the judge isn't going to do anything to help the abuse situation there's no requirement towards to that we have some some experience, uh, some limited experience in other states uh, now. We have 30 states approximately, I think, have parental, so-called parental consent or notification laws. Uh, an interesting question of what we've seen in those states. One specific question I would have is, uh, with prior notification arrangements, one might speculate that there would be increasing delays by teenagers in even getting to making these decisions, that they would procrastinate or avoid out of fear, out of, out of anxiety, out of embarrassment, whatever the reasons are. So in these 30 states or in other contexts where we've had such provisions, do we see indeed an increase in the number of births, unwanted births? No. What are, they, what are the actual impacts of the legislation as yeah. envisioned? Um, it certainly does vary from state to state um, exactly what the impact is, um, but there has not been a significant increase in the birth rate. Um, and in some of the states, not all of them, but in some of them there has been a decrease in both the the birth rate and the abortion rate, meaning there's a decrease in the pregnancy but rate. But I think that what you have to put on top of that is that in the last 10 years, and we can even look at California specifically, there has, California has led the nation in decreasing the number of teen pregnancies by 44% the, over the last 10 years without these kinds of mandates and initiatives. So it doesn't serve that purpose. We have seen that um, young people do in fact delay. They, almost by nature delay because they don't want to admit that this has happened. They, you know, they're like, oh, it's going to go away. It's going to, you know, fix itself before they finally start seeking help. And so they do delay. They go across state lines. They take matters into their own hands. And I would be very concerned as a parent here with the proximity to the Mexico border that that may be one of the options they think they turn to. Uh, just talk for a moment about the, the, me the mechanisms that put this initiative on the California ballot for this November. Uh, who led the effort to put this on the ballot? Uh, you know, where did it come from? I think the important thing to know about this particular ballot and how this initiative and how it got into the ballot is there's one person here in San Diego who put up the majority of the money that was necessary to get the number of signatures that they needed. They pay for signatures. All initiatives are done that way in terms of getting money up front to get the signatures to put it on the ballot. One person, this isn't anything that we've had any kind of debate about in this state. Right, uh, James Holman in, yes, Car Jim in Holman. Coronado. He right. owns a it, chain of Catholic newspapers. He owns uh, the San Diego, the San Diego News Weekly. Notes. He put up also a bit the over reader. a million dollars. Exactly, for this exactly. Um, and uh, Governor Schwarzenegger has endorsed this initiative, as I understand it. Um, 
uh, interesting that he's a, a moderate Republican who has characterized himself as pro-choice running I, when he ran for office. You know, office. I think that it really points to the fact that on its surface, people may look at this and say, oh, absolutely, a parent ought to know what's going on with their child. It's really getting into the complexities of the issue. And when you look at the governor giving his endorsement, what you can weigh that against is the American uh, Pediatric Association has also endorsed this, the California Nurses Association, the California Division of ACOG, the American Obstetrics and gynecologist associations, you know, the very heavyweight medical professionals have said we endorse say, saying no on Prop 73. But parents tend to uh, support something like this because they understand the necessity of being involved in the initiative itself because I'm not, we were not involved in any of the process of putting that on the ballot. But when we look at something, we also want to make sure that we're backing something that makes sense and also something that will stand constitutional muster. There's no reason to put efforts into something that could then be struck down by the United States Supreme Court. And um, this initiative from our research shows that it, it follows it takes uh, basically the best of the other uh, notification laws that are in effect in other states and that have been upheld by the United States Supreme Court. Um, and it's, it's well, it, common. That raises it's an interesting point, though, about, uh, about the, the high court. There, there has been uh, a challenge. Uh, this, the U.S. Supreme Court is scheduled to hear a, a case uh, out of New Hampshire that involves a law very similar uh, to the one that is now on the California ballot, uh, uh, the case called IOT v. Planned Parenthood. So uh, Nancy, why don't you explain what the case is about and then uh, Michaeline, you can uh, give us your view of the possible ruling the court will There is on. certainly um, some um, similarities between this particular case and the initiative that's on the ballot here. Primarily it is a parental consent case. The issue that is going before the Supreme Court is an issue that has been a precedent set by the Supreme Court for many, many years, and that's the precedent that protects a woman's health in, in any of these laws that um, are related to reproductive health. So we are very concerned that the Supreme Court has um, decided to hear this particular case, especially with that particular piece of it, because um, where Sandra, Sandra Day O'Connor was always just the stalwart for to really supporting the women's health um, piece of that in all of the reproductive rights legislation. The key really in here is, and what makes it different from the initiative that we're talking about, is that in that case there is not a specific health exception in. There is an exception for a medical emergency where her life is in danger. Um, here in California, the initiative does go further than that and does put an exception for the notification when there is going to be, um, um, or the doctor feels that there is going to be potential harm to a major bodily function for the woman, which is very important to have in there to protect her health in that case. So it may impact this decision, it may not. It's going to decide, it's going to depend upon how the court comes down on it because we do have extra provision for that in this initiative. A question uh, again about the distinctiveness of of the ballot proposition here in California. Uh, there is a wording uh, in the proposition that uses the phrase death of an unborn child, as I understand it, rather than abortion. Uh, this also has uh, excited a lot of controversy. It presumably has implications for higher court decisions. Uh, what, are, what are your positions on that matter? And where did that wording come from? Again, from this, this fellow Holman, or, or did it emerge from some other process? That particular language is something that we've seen as a trend in some other legislation um, and then at the national level where in an effort to um, give rights to the unborn fetus um, and in, in some ways usurping the rights of the woman to make decisions about her own body, we're starting to see some some of this legislation and some of this language in this legislation. That is, of course, another concern. I think it points out to the real complexities that are written into this particular legislation that I would encourage voters to look beyond the surface of this legislation, look beyond and see that if there are over 50% of teenagers involving their parents already, this particular initiative is going to do nothing to affect them. If there are some teenagers who, for some reason, cannot go to this to their parents, cannot go and talk to them. This initiative isn't going to do anything to enhance their ability to communicate better with their parents. So you look at it and say, then what's the point? 
who does this really help? Yeah. What is it that this initiative you, will you really accomplish? I, 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 I absolutely disagree with that. I mean, it, for the for the um, a percentage of teenagers that are not speaking with their parents right now, this would have an impact on them. Um, it would involve the parents um, in that process and that can only be a good thing for her unless we're talking about an extreme case of abuse and then there is provision that is there for it. Um, as far as the particular language, if you, you know, those reviewers who are reading through and I hope they read through everything that's in the voter guide there, it is important in any piece of legislation to define what it is that you're talking about um, and certainly um, you have to define the terms and that's not the only term that is defined um, in there. This initiative is what it says it is and that's why someone like pro-choice Governor Schwarzenegger and a significant number of people who would call themselves pro-choice support this because they want to be involved in the decision with their daughters. Um, we have had these laws in effect sometimes over 20 well, years in other states and it has not eroded or restricted abortion but, but at a, all. But a quick, two quick questions this regard. First of all, uh, uh, it, it is interesting of course that the proposition ends up on the ballot not because of some popular movement to put it there. This is almost single-handedly But it is a popular movement. Over a million people signed that that. By virtue and of 1.2 million dollars spent and by an individual, and, and the they other question paid would be, to the other question it. would be, no, no, but they're paid to get the signatures. This goes to the heart of the proposition. No, but, the person, but, if you look at but wouldn't it have been wiser? This. What do you say to the argument? Would it have been wiser to wait for the Supreme Court to act on IOT before putting this on the ballot? Because if IOT, if IOT is decided in a form that renders this unconstitutional in the eyes of federal authorities, why, why are we going well, through this California process here? The California State Legislature back in the 80s passed, excuse me, passed parental consent. So this is something that has been tried through the legislative process by those of us who have elect, who have voted for our elected officials. And this has gone through. It was strong bipartisan support at that time. And it's very important to understand why it hasn't been enforced is because the state Supreme Court of California determined that the right to privacy in the state constitution of California was upheld in the parental consent decision. So they said that the right to privacy, which this initiative is trying to take away, did apply in these particular instances. One, one additional question in that regard, I was, I was thinking about this uh, as we prepared for this discussion. Are there any states that require parental notification when a child, a minor, presents to deliver a child? In other words, when a child has made the decision to bring a pregnancy to term, are there any laws that require an adult be involved in that decision that you know? But the and parents already know no, that no. she if has not, child, not, if not child necessarily. If a child is not living with the parents or in an abusive situation, all these circumstances that would apply in this case with a child seeking to terminate a pregnancy, are there any laws in any of the 50 states that require that parents or responsible adults or a judge be notified about a child's decision to carry to term? I'm, I'm curious, Is are there? Not to my knowledge. And in fact, in the state of California, that once a young woman is pregnant, that determines that she's emancipated and she can make those decisions for herself without the parent involvement. Okay. Well, I thank you both uh, for a very lively and uh, interesting discussion. My guests have been Michaeline Friedenberg of Life Perspectives and Nancy Sasaki of Planned Parenthood of San Diego and Riverside Counties. Next up, Propositions 78 and 79, the Prescription Drug Initiatives. Do you know the difference between the two? You will in a moment. We'll be right back. Now, to the two propositions that both offer discounts for prescription drugs. To explain why there are two propositions on the ballot, we turn to Thad Kauser, an assistant professor of political science here at UC San Diego, an expert on the state initiative process. Thad, what's the difference between Propositions 78 and 79? Well, it is confusing. We have dueling propositions on the ballot, just like we had with gambling initiatives last fall, and the 
car insurance initiatives in 1988 where we had five initiatives. So there's a little bit less confusing, but there are clear differences between these two initiatives. So the first one to be written, the second on the ballot, is Proposition 79. It was written by a healthcare ad advocacy group that works with the Service Employees International Union, people who uh, make enough money so they don't get free health care but don't make enough money to, form, to get most prescription drugs. Here's how it works. It would create a drug discount card that would entitle anyone who is uh, in a family making less than four times the poverty rate. So it's about $39,000 for an individual to get discounts on prescription drugs if that drug is offered at a discount to Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Now, Medi-Cal is a state program that provides you know, health care for the poor, the disabled, and seniors. And a lot of drug companies will offer drugs at discounts to Medi-Cal because they're selling to a population that wouldn't ordinarily buy their drugs and opens them up to a big new market. If they wanted to participate in that program, they would have to participate in the drug discount program for Proposition 79. Um, there'd be no so th way. This is a way to enforce their participation. Right. So this is basically, essentially, a mandatory drug discount program where anyone who qualifies for it gets the drugs, and just about any drug manufacturer has to take part in this. Now, Proposition 78 was written by the pharmaceutical industry, and it, not surprisingly, takes a less aggressive approach. And here's what it would say. It would also create a similar drug discount card for people who make up to three times the poverty level, so similar eligibility requirements, but participation would be optional. So a drug company, independent of whether or not it was offering uh, discounted drugs to Medi-Cal beneficiaries, it would get to decide whether it wanted to get uh, a big new uh, consumer group, people making uh, you know, generally too little money to afford their drugs, it could offer them drugs at a discount or could decide not to. And that's why it's uh, more you know, beneficial to, that's why the pharmaceutical industries like it. Uh, Proposition 78, the optional program, is backed by the pharmaceutical industry that's raised about $80 million to advocate for it. It's backed by business groups like the Chamber of Commerce and it's backed by the Republican Party. Proposition 79, the mandatory program that requires drug companies to participate, is backed by union groups and the Democratic Party. What happens if both propositions pass? With all dueling initiatives, if both pass, the one that gets the most vote goes into effect. So if one gets 65 percent, the other gets 64 percent, the 65 percent one wins. And, and the other disappears. And the other disappears from the okay. state constitution. Uh, because right now, the uh, field poll shows both propositions in the lead, uh, as it were, right? By roughly similar margins? Well, there's, a lot, of, there's a lot of undecided voters. Um, and, and in fact, I think because, uh, because there's been this uh, recognition that Proposition 78 comes from the pharmaceutical industry and a lot of Prop 78 money being spent against Prop 79. The polls I've seen have shown that the both are struggling, and there's a lot of undecided voters le left to get. But it's but it could be possible that both of these initiatives fail. So, uh, when you say just uh, for for uh, the sake of our viewers, when you say that. Uh, um, Proposition 78 has been written by the by the pharmaceutical company. So literally, uh, the companies got together uh, at a country club and started <laughs> drafting a proposition. Probably How does not. That work? Uh, probably not at a country club, <laughs> but, but pharma, which is the organization that brings together these uh, that their brings trade together these groups, their trade association. They were involved in writing it. Um, you don't see their names on the uh, on the pro so arguments that you see in your voters that voters books because they want to present uh, you know a, a more uh, popular face. But but that was the group behind it. Just like the union groups, which are not signing the ballot argument in, in favor of Prop 79, it was a union group health access uh, were, were the main authors of Proposition 79. Okay, so we've got tape of, of ads running concerning these propositions. We've got a tape of an ad that's running frequently uh, on the airwaves right now that says no on 79. Let's, mm -hmm. let's take a look. There's a problem with Proposition 79 that Californians should be concerned about. With Prop 79, patients on Medi-Cal could be denied medicine their doctor prescribes. 79 allows Sacramento to decide what drugs would be authorized, which could restrict access to the latest medications for the most vulnerable among us. See for yourself. Prop 79 is the wrong prescription for California. So here we have a, a negative ad. This uh -huh. is an ad against uh, uh, 79. Is it accurate? What's the message here? Well, like most political ads, it contains a grain of truth and then a bit of political spin. So, so here's the grain of truth. Uh, Prop 79 says that if a company offers its drug to Medi-Cal beneficiaries, it's got to offer it to the new people who have the new discount card. That means if they want to pull out of the discount card and not participate it, 
participate in it, they also have to pull out of the Medi-Cal Medi program, and that's where someone could be denied. So I'm right now medical Medi-Cal recipient. I get a drug. If that drug company doesn't want to offer this cons this drug to other uh, low-income consumers, then I could be denied my drug. Here's the exception that's meant to uh, stop that from hurting anyone's sort of health. If you're, there is no therapeutic equivalent to your drug, if there's nothing else that you can take for this condition, then all of Prop 79 is off. You do not, the drug company would not have to offer it to, uh, to discount card holders and, if they had it for Medi-Cal. So, so no one would be denied a drug that has a, no therapeutic equivalent. So in let, if, that, if, I, if I don't have any other options, I'm not going to be rejected. You still have access, couch. but that's not being made, made clear. That's not being made clear? Well, now we have the other side. We have a yes on 79 spots. So let's take a minute to look at that. I might look like a nice little old lady, but I'm not. I'm an angry old lady. I'm mad at the rising cost of prescription drugs. Now I see that all the big drug companies have gotten together and chipped in a record-breaking $78 million for an expensive political campaign to fool us into thinking they are doing something about the cost of prescription drugs in California. Say no to outrageous prescription drug prices and to the big drug company sham. Join me in voting yes on Proposition 79. So interestingly here, another negative, but negative about the authors of a proposition, not about the proposition itself. Well, I think that's probably a savvy political strategy because what we know is that, that voters have a lot of trouble sort of figuring out all the details of propositions. And when voters have confusing propositions that, that deal with complex policy areas, like the ones addressed by 78 and 79, they normally look to cues like, who's behind this initiative and who opposes it and do I agree with those groups? So we saw with the car insurance examples that the Ralph Nader one, because he had such a strong name brand as a consumer advocate, that one and the car insurance uh, ones that were backed by car insurance companies lost. The hope of the backers of Prop 79 is that the fact that voters don't really like pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical industry right now, don't identify that they have common interests with the pharmaceutical industry, they're going to vote against 78 and possibly with 79 because they feel more affinity for the, con for the consumer groups that are with it. So it's an attempt to use voter cues to uh, make their case. So, rather than so that, that really leads to my next question. You've anticipated it about how voters make up their minds with these complicated propositions, confusingly presented. Mm -hmm. And in the case of California, of course, our ballots are now full of these propositions mm -hmm. every November. There's never a kind of light year anymore. Right. Well, voters make up their minds in, in a pretty rational way. Is Instead of trying to figure out all of the substance, you sort of delegate that to someone else. And you find a group that you know represents your interests, whether that's unions, the Democratic Party, consumer groups, uh, business groups, uh, a particular industry that you feel an affinity with, and you vote the way that they have endorsed. And that's a nice shortcut that actually leads to people voting in a way that sort of reflects their economic interests. One final question, turnout. What, uh, what do you and your colleagues anticipate in the way of turnout for this election? And how does that affect Props 78 and 79 as you see Turnout's said. probably going to be strange because it's going to be polarized. There are going to be a lot of people who are either on the labor side or the business side who have been motivated by those groups. So we're probably going to see a lot of the people on the ends of the political spectrum turn out. And those in the middle who don't really see this as being an important election are probably going to stay home. So, so all bets are off as to whether raising turnout will help a liberal or a conservative cause. It'll be which of the groups, the right or the left wing, can get more of their people to the polls. Can get more people out. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for having me. That's it for this edition of The Body Politic. I'm Michael Bernstein here at the University of California, San Diego. See you at the polls on Election Day. Good night.